She's a woman of mystery. You can dig, you can dig, you can dig, you can dig, you can dig. A woman of surprises. What are you doing here? A woman named Susan. Come on, come on. Come on Orion come on. Pictures presents Desperately Seeking Susan. Susan! 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 Oh my God, we all thought you were dead. No, oh, just in New Jersey. Madonna is Susan. The hottest voice in rock is now the freshest face on film. Every man is desperate to have her. One woman is desperate to be her. Everybody I know is desperate except you. I'm desperate. You? <laughs> but someone is desperate to kill her. Killed? Come on, come on. Dead? If he can figure out who she is. Come on, come on. I'm not Susan. I don't believe it. I'm a housewife and I live in Fort Lee, New Jersey. You never stop, do you? Starring Rosanna Arquette as Roberta. You know, Gary, between you and me, what do you really know about Roberta? She doesn't even like sex that much. It's impossible. She'll love it. You can dig, you can dig. And Madonna as Susan. No more dead bodies, okay? I'll see what I can do. Bye-bye, Bruce. It was fun, huh? Maybe you were the killer. You were with this guy? Come on, come on. I was breathing when I left. Desperately seeking Susan. A life so crazy it takes two women to live it. attention I got an agent in LA and my agent started sending me lots of scripts and for the most part they were really dumb and I knew especially back then since there were so few women making movies or directing movies that I had to be really smart about what I picked next and I had to do something that I felt I could do differently than the other directors that were working, and mostly male directors that were working at that time. Porky's had come out, right. and if you know anything about Hollywood and L.A., you know, they kind of want you to do the same thing, but slightly different. But I, I had no desire to do that. We had the support of, uh, this was Orion Pictures, which is a studio, but it was one of the most independent, spirited of the studios. Oliver Stone was working for them. Woody Allen did all his 80s movies for them. Jonathan Demme was working for them. So they were a studio that respected their directors. And it just felt like the right fit. Yeah, I went to NYU Film School in, in the mid-70s, and back then, uh, A, film schools weren't that popular yet, and there were 35 people in my class, and uh, 30 men and 5 women. The NYU Film School, the grad school, was in a very funky building on East 6th Street and 2nd Avenue. But the great thing about that is that they kind of encouraged you to do your own thing. I mean, for example, when I made Smithereens, I didn't even know you needed permits to film on the streets. <laughs> this was when New York was pretty gritty and dirty. <laughs> in that funkiness, there was a lot of freedom. When the script came to me, the producers told me that they were interested in, they had one actress that was interested in starring in the film, 
and that was Roseanne Arquette, who was just beginning to, to generate some buzz. She originally, when she was first sent the script, thought she was going to play the Susan role. They told her, no, it's the Roberta role. Um, so we started to look, for, so then I got attached, because then, at that time, Smithereens had come out, the producers had seen the film, and, you know, and I was attached as the director now. And so we started the audition process, and at that time, you must have auditioned kind of every young leading lady that was around at the time, like Melanie Griffith, Jamie Lee Curtis, Jennifer Jason Lee, Ellen Barkin. Uh, they all came in to audition for that role. I lived on Thompson Street at the time, and I kind of was involved a little bit in the sort of downtown music scene, having made Smithereens with Richard Hell, and so I, I kind of knew of Madonna, but I didn't, she wasn't a friend. When I first got the script, it was about nine, early 1984, end of 83, something like that. MTV had started in 1981, and there weren't that many videos, music videos at the time. So I, so whatever videos there, there were, they were on heavy rotation, so I saw I guess it was borderline or lucky star, you know. <laughs> it kept playing, and I thought, God, that that woman who whose name I knew already was really interesting, and she really knew how to kind of engage the camera and sort of flirt with the camera in a really cool way. And I thought that that's the quality that would be interesting to give to the character of Susan. Ask the casting directors to kind of bring her in. She had that X factor, that yeah. something special, mm -hmm. and if I could capture that on film, that would be great. She's saying scripted lines, she's hitting her light, she's making her mark. You know, there was a lot of technical, there was a lot of acting and technique involved in that. And I knew she was a dancer, and that really helps in terms of performing in front of the camera. One world would be this uh, sort of suburban housewife world. Everything was sort of lit with very soft lighting. All the wardrobe is in pastels. The bedroom is sort of pink, you know, ballet slipper pink. Um, and then Madonna's world, or the Susan world, which we knew we wanted to make kind of magical. Ed Lockman, uh, it was his idea to come up with using colored gels in exterior lighting, like if you see there's a shot where, uh, for example, where Roseanne Arquette and Aidan Quinn are walking to his his loft down an alleyway and there's a, a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant on the side, and it's all lit in kind of red and green gels, just to take it, make it hyper real. Not, we weren't interested in reality, we we're interested in hyper reality, but still keeping the characters real. You know, everything from the costumes, the lighting, the set design, everything, to just make these two worlds. And what was great is that Santo was both the production designer and the costume designer. So he could really, he knew what people were going to be wearing when they were in a specific room. So it all kind of blended together. We knew that there was something great about Madonna's persona, and so... Um, rather than having her wearing costumes, he went to her um, apartment. I, I remember at the time she was living like two blocks away from me on Broom Street, you know, and went through her closet. Um, I mean, he mixed and matched things, but a lot of it was hers. Interestingly, he came up with the pyramid jacket. That was Santo who created that. She didn't like it at first. <laughs> no, she didn't. It's funny because it's so um, much a part of her now. But when I, he told me that when she first saw it, he, you know, she wasn't crazy about it. And I guess it grew on her. Into the groove, uh, well, and she said, "I have a tape that I." You know, just a, a new song that I wrote with um, Stephen Bray. Right. And she said, can I bring it in tomorrow? And I said, sure. She brought it in. And so we used it literally just to get the crowd and the background dancing. And so what base, and, and thinking that in post-production we would put in 
some other song or a more famous song. Um, <laughs> and what we didn't know is uh, her career would skyrocket and then suddenly Orion would say, can you get a Madonna song? <laughs> and we, we had one and uh, that's how that came. You know, follow your passion. I guess the other thing is make stuff. Uh, but you just have to kind of keep making making stuff um, and, uh, and, and being passionate about what you make. You know, part of it is because this was an Orion movie. Orion went bankrupt in 1990. Weirdly enough, right after they made their biggest hit, Silence of the Lamb. <laughs> they then went bankrupt. Um, and so MGM took over all the Orion films. So, you know, kind of dealing with MGM and how they decide to, you know, what they decide to release is, uh, you know, I, I don't know. The screenplay did go through several drafts and several people were brought in to, to revise it. The story remained the same and the concept, the, the, Biggest thing is the theme and the concept stayed the same. The details changed. Um, as just an example, when the script was first written, which I think was in the late 70s, like 1979, and I wasn't involved, the Susan character was kind of different. She was more of like a, it was the 70s, she was more of like a hippie traveler you know, back from Guatemala with a backpack. <laughs> and the, um, executives at, um, it wasn't Orion at the time, I think Warner Brothers had optioned this screenplay at one point, pre me. Um, uh, they were talking like Goldie Hawn, Diane, uh, uh, Keaton. Yeah. So it was that kind of a character. Right. Um, and then when I came in, again, because uh, coming from smithereens and just my own sensibility and what I wanted to bring to it, the tone of Susan changed. And I'd love to take credit for it. Madonna doing her armpits. Uh, <laughs> was Madonna came up with that? You know, it was scripted. She just blows, you know, dries herself with the hair blower, but she oh, nice. she did that. Um, Stephen Wright, mm -hmm. um, you have great teeth. A uh, line that he says to Lorena <laughs> improv. is you realize there were so many people at the start of their career, Aidan Quinn, Tutoro, even uh, Giancarlo Esposito was there on the street. Uh, Laurie Metcalf, first movie. You know, there's just so many firsts. But I knew kind of these East Village characters like John Laurie or Rocket's Red Glare or Richard Edson or, you know, mix of up and coming stage and, and film actors mixed with these sort of downtown celebs and Magnuson who I got to work with in making Mr. Right. You know, that combination of, of, a, of a kind of weird cast, I think, brought out the best in both. The Magic Club was actually called the um, Audubon Ballroom. It was up in oh, Harlem. It was oh my God, it's up in my neighborhood, Washington Heights. It was where Malcolm X was shot. <laughs> so that yes. is what, and it was, and it was uh, closed down in the 60s, I guess. So we were filming in 84. It was falling apart, the inside, you know, you had it like there were holes in the floor. And what was great was that Santo was able to kind of go in there, sort of patch it up, but not too much. We liked that it was still kind of yeah. Yeah. funky, but it was the Audubon Ballroom. I love that. I live on 115th and Broadway. There you go. And I've always been like, that can't be 14th yeah. Street. That can't be Astor Place. No. Like, where is that? Again, I think the, actually the Magic Club was the most fun to film. It just had so many wacky elements. I mean, if you look at the audience of the Magic Club, it's kind of a mix. It's sort of retro. It's sort of like a mafia club. It looks a little gangstery, but it also looks a little new wave. It looks a little 
like a geriatric <laughs> Broadway Danny Rose. <laughs>